Day. This is the fourth event out of what will probably amount to be about 100 before Election Day. Uh, in addition to the, the news gathering, we have, she, maybe I'll leave it to Amy to describe the, the work days that we've made, maintained for the last two weeks. It's uh, been really grueling staying up late, getting up early, and, and doing the show. And, so it's, it's going to be fun two, two months, and I can't think of a better place to kick it off here after the conventions in Asheville. Um, I always like to be reminded that uh, Noam Chomsky says when he speaks to an audience, you can tell uh, if there's a community radio in the, uh, in the region without even knowing because the engagement of the audience, the, 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 the quality of the questions, the size of the crowd, he can just tell there must be a strong radio station in the area. That's uh, been a lesson for me, and I can tell that there's one here. So thanks to you and for having us, and here's Amy Goodman. in Washington, you know, the AT&Ts and the Verizons. And, oh, in the December before the 2008 election, you may remember at that time that AT&T, Verizon, and other telecoms were implicated in um, spying on American people, on American citizens. And um, legislation was introduced to grant them retroactive immunity. And President of uh, the time, Senator Obama, put on his website that he would not only not support this, but he would filibuster this. And as the time rolled around to vote on these, which was around um, uh, the, the end of spring, leading into the Democratic Convention, he not only didn't filibuster, but he voted for the legislation. And within a week, we saw the prototype bags, delegates' bags, that were going to all the Democrats. And they had an AT&T logo emblazoned on both sides of those bags. So AT&T threw the Democrats a wonderful thank you party as they came into 
Denver. And these parties matter, you know. <clears throat> Something interesting goes on there. You've got the young legislators, state legislators, state council members who come in from around the country, and it's a kind of acculturation, acculturation process where they're learning how politics works in this country. In some cases at these parties, you have more lobbyists than delegates. And you come in, they give you swag bags, um, and sometimes they show you prototypes of legislation. You know, they might find out you're a state legislator, you know, if you need any help in uh, designing a bill, um, <coughs> and you could be the co-sponsor or the sponsor of your own bill, we'll help you write it. Um, and you know the results of that at the national level when lobbyists write the legislation. Um, particularly when it comes to the internet, we have to be so careful that these large corporations don't write the legislation, which so often uh, their fingerprints are all over, that would privatize the internet. The internet could be the greatest democratizing force. It allows us to horizontally communicate with people around the world. All the public resources that are put into developing the internet, now when it's so clearly um, the channel of communication of the future, corporations want to privatize it and reap the profits. And really shut down a lot of the democratic communication uh, so that you could have a, a Dalit women website in India that they you hit and it just doesn't come up. Or Democracy Now! maybe takes 10 minutes, but you go to google.com and it's right there. And you start to get this two, three, four tiered system. And we have to completely fight against that and be extremely vigilant because so often legislators, state senators, congressmen for senators don't even understand what the legislature is that they have been handed. Uh, some do understand it very well, but they're also waiting to get something else handed to them. Um, and we watched that take place and try to follow the money as we went to the Republican and Democratic conventions. But just to continue um, with my uh, bag, this happens to be with my credential, the one for the Democratic convention, but you know, they're similar for the, for the Republicans. So my AT&T lanyard, and then this says, um, uh, this is for Thursday. It was supposed to be outside at the Bank of America Stadium. Um, and on the other side, um, it talks about, uh, well, as Dennis said, the Time Warner Cable Arena, which is where it ultimately took place because of the weather. Um, uh, so um, Bank of America Stadium, though, wasn't used. It was quite remarkable to see the Democrats simply rename it for the week, uh, Panther Stadium. Now, when we were following the protests last Sunday, I kept asking people, what is that place over there that's at Bank of America Stadium? I said, what's that called? And they would say, Bank of America Stadium. And I would ask the police, what's that called? They'd say, Bank of America Stadium. Uh, but the Democrats were calling it Panther Stadium because they understood the significance, the metaphor that this presented, that President Obama would be giving his second address, uh, you know, acceptance speech um, at, uh, in a stadium whose uh, naming rights was bought by this major financial institution. These financial institutions that have brought this country almost to ruin as serious as uh, 75 years ago with, uh, with the Depression. We have never faced something so serious as we're facing today. And instead of taking uh, you know, the city banks and the Goldman Sachs and, uh, and the Bank of Americas to task um, investigating them, uh, instead they're arresting the people who protest this government uh, corporate collusion that has le have left so many, many people in this country in ruin. Um, <clears throat> so we cover the, the conventions inside and out. And at the Democratic convention this week, the first day we followed the protesters. Well, let me go to the, to the Republican convention, because remember, it, Hurricane Isaac was about to hit Tampa. And on Monday, um, about 500 protesters came out uh, to protest the Republican agenda. 
weekend, there were a number of Republican tweets that were swirling around, like, you know, the, the organizer said there would be thousands, how pathetic, there's only 500, you know, it wasn't enormous, there was not an enormous amount of protesters. But I couldn't help but think, 50,000 people had come into Tampa for the Republican convention um, on Monday, and they canceled the convention because of the rain. Um, so they didn't even mean, manage to show up. Here, 500 brave souls uh, braved the rain, and they did show up. So they had something to show those Republican delegates who were tweeting from their rooms. Um, now, what they faced, um, there was a permitted protest in the morning, and then there was the unpermitted one run by Sherry Honkala, who is one of the leading anti-poverty activists in this country, was homeless herself with her son, who's now an actor, um, and continues to uh, champion the cause of people who have no means and yet are really changing this country by organizing. Don't forget, you know, when Dr. King was alive, uh, what he was doing when he died, he was organizing the Poor People's March to Washington. So Sherry Hunkala has now gone from uh, being an anti-poverty organizer to being the vice presidential candidate of the Green Party, chosen by Dr. Jill Stein as her running mate. And in the afternoon, in the pouring rain, um, she announced from Romneyville that they would just start marching. Oh, Romneyville, they had Obamaville as well, but these, are, um, these were named after the Hoovervilles of the Depression, and they were set up, and people lived there. A very interesting time when we went there in the pouring rain. Um, we met an interesting group of workers there, workers who feel the pain of Bain. By the way, Dennis is uh, handing out the Daily Digest, the email list, so uh, we can send you our headlines and uh, our media alerts, and it's a great way to stay in touch. But um, we met workers who feel the pain of Bain, a quite a remarkable group of four who come from Northwest Illinois four hardy souls from rural Illinois who joined tens of thousands of people undeterred by threats of Hurricane Isaac uh, to go to the Republican convention. They weren't, though, among the, um, oh, the, let me just see, I'm just looking at the column that we did that week from the Republican convention. They weren't among the, 50,000 people who were going inside the convention. They were the ones who were going to be outside. Um, facing the $50 million worth of U.S. taxpayer money that was going into militarizing the local police department. And as the Republicans decried government spending, I could only think about how much was going in to throw their party. $50 million to the police authorities, and then another something like $18 million to the party. And the same went for the Democrats. You know, there's so much made of the partisan bickering in Washington. I think the major problem is the bipartisan consensus in Washington. among the 50,000 who were there for the convention, uh, they were about to join a much larger group, the more than 2.4 million people in the past decade whose U.S. jobs have been shipped to China. In their case, the company laying them off and sending their jobs overseas is Bain Capital, co-founded by the Republican presidential candidate, Mitt Romney. Now, this is how they found out what was happening to the country, the company. They were originally owned by Honeywell, and they make these sensors for automobiles. And and they worked there for decades, the four people who we met at Romneyville. And then um, a group of them, including Cheryl Randecker, who is about oh, 52 years old, was sent to China 
to train Chinese workers. She didn't know why in Chinese management. Um, at, it was there that she learned that the company was being sold when she was in China. When they came, when she came back, then Chinese workers came to their Honeywell plant to, and they had to train them further. So they're essentially training their replacements. And then the company starts to send equipment over to China. And they're trying to figure out who is taking us over, because at first the company denied that they were being sold. And they learned it was Sensata, um, the Sensata company, and they didn't have, had, never had heard of it. And they looked it up, and it was owned by Bain Capital. And it was only this summer that they put the whole thing together, understanding that Bain Capital was founded by and um, uh, the Republican presidential candidate, Mitt Romney. So in a sense, though they were shocked, they thought, oh, we have some recourse, because he goes out on the campaign trail uh, concerned about what's happening, especially to workers and jobs in this country, so they could tell them his, their plight, and maybe he could do something about it, because he still wields so much power there. Um, so uh, they went uh, two weeks ago. They heard he was going to be speaking in Iowa. And they went to uh, to um, to Iowa. I'm trying to find the name of the town that they went to. First, they went to uh, Bain Capital in Evanston, Illinois, to deliver 35,000 signatures to try to get their jobs back, um, and they were turned away. Then they went to the Bain Capital in Madison, Wisconsin, and the company called the police. So then they went to Iowa, to Bettendorf, Iowa, and Tom Galra, again, who'd worked there for 33 years, stood up when Romney was speaking and appealed to him to come to Freeport, where their company is, to help them save their jobs. He was shouted down by the crowd, uh, which chanted, USA, USA. <laughs> and Tom said, we're there trying to save our jobs, and they're calling us communists for trying to stop our American jobs from being sent to communist China. <laughs> So, I asked Cheryl why they're going after Mitt Romney, since he doesn't own the company anymore. Um, she said, Mitt Romney created the model of outsourcing jobs. He created Bain. He's still reaping very high benefits from Bain financially, so he can pick up the phone and call his buddies and say, we need to stop this practice and keep the US jobs here. Bonnie Borman was the third of these workers. She was pregnant with her daughter when she started working at the factory, the Honeywell factory, 23 years ago. She told me, I now have to compete with my daughter for minimum wage jobs. Tom added, we've been told our last day of work will be Friday, November 2nd. We'll file for unemployment the following Monday. The day after that, we vote, he said. Um, just to be safe, I said they should bring a photo ID. <laughs> um, it is so important to hear people describe their own stories. Uh, I was just on a, a national public radio in uh, Durham, and the, uh, Frank Stasio was the is the host of this program, and he was uh, asking about how it was that with thousands of reporters at these protests at the Democrat and Republican convention, well, we covered the immigrants' rights protests here in in Charlotte, and. And uh, he said how it is, uh, he went as well. He said that no one got the story but us. Now, what does that mean? That we have an exclusive story of a protest that was held out in the open. Uh, I had such a fascinating experience. Amazing group of young people and their parents who came out in the pouring rain this week on the opening day of the Democratic Convention as it was gaveled. And they engaged in civil disobedience, sitting down on a huge banner of butterflies. Um, their motto was, no papers, no fear. This is the undocumented immigrant movement in this country that has really swept President Obama's policy off its feet to the point where they had occupied so many of his campaign offices that, um, that he announced that the Department of Homeland Security would be giving a reprieve to 30 and under, 30 years old and under um, students, young people that you know who grew up in this country, who worked in this country, 
country who paid their taxes in this country, um, and that they would not be deported. Um, and he even, from the convention floor, talked about how brave these souls were. Uh, I don't know if he was talking about the people who were protesting right outside the Democratic convention. Um, but it's uh, really important to talk about hearing these voices, because we're so used to the media, you know, all the corporate networks, with these small circle of pundits who know so little about so much explaining the world to us and getting it so wrong. <laughs> so I was, I was standing on the corner of the street. I'd heard this protest was about to take place. And then this beat up but beautifully painted kind of school bus pulled up. I mean, there are hundreds, thousands of police officers all over Charlotte. And they pull up on this corner. And young and old come out chanting, waving their fists in the air, no papers, no fe fear. No papers, no fear. And they start marching very quickly to the convention. Center. They're the ones who will commit to civil disobedience and all of their supporters. And it is pouring rain. But on this corner, as the bus was coming up, I was talking to uh, Rosie Carrasco. We'd had her on the show the day before. And she was committing civil disobedience with her husband and her daughter. You realize all of these people are not only risking arrest, but they're risking being deported when they do this. But they're doing it for such an important cause. I talked to one young woman who had her arm around a much smaller, older woman the whole time as they sat in the rain with their heads bowed. And then when the police moved in on them, um, said no papers, no fear, and also spoke in Spanish. And I said, who are you? you and who is the woman you have your arm around? She said, this is my mother. And so I said, well, can't you, um, uh, wouldn't you qualify to, uh, under President Obama's new policy, like you wouldn't have to be deported? She said, but my mother wouldn't. And if she's deported, I might as well be deported. And they both got arrested. So, but just as the bus pulled up to a stop and people got out, a big one of those pundits on television on one of the networks, I won't say his name, but he came up to me and he said, what's happening here? So I said, well, you know, these are undocumented immigrants and they, um, and they are about to engage in civil disobedience. And he said, I was talking to Rosie at this time, the leader of the group, and he said, what do they want? What does she want? And so I said, well, why don't you ask Rosie? Because um, that's just what I was asking her. What do you want? And she said, well, just, he said, just tell me, tell me, what does she want? I said, Rosie, what do you want? And so um, he actually took out his notebook as she spoke and took down her words. And this is what we have to demand of the corporate media. You know, don't forget, they are using our airwaves. They are using a national treasure. The airwaves are the national airwaves. <laughs> Rosie Carrasco said, we are here to ask President Obama what his legacy will be. What we want to say to President Obama is on which side of history is he going to be? Is he going to be remembered as the president that's been deporting the most people in US history, or is he going to be on the side of immigrants? I thought that was really easy to understand. Um, and very quotable, you know, really eloquent, and much more significant for a reporter uh, to write that down um, than to turn to someone else and that could try to interpret that for him. And that is so important, that we open up the media, that we provide a forum for people to speak for themselves. I see the media as a huge kitchen table that stretches across the globe, that we all sit around and debate and discuss the most important issues of the day, war and peace, life and death, and anything less than that is a disservice to the service men and women of this country, because they can't have these debates on military bases. They rely on us and civilian society to have the discussions that lead to the decisions about whether they live or die, whether they're sent to kill or be killed. Anything less than that is a 
disservice to a democratic society. You know, when Mitt Romney took to the floor of the convention center in, uh, in Tampa, his acceptance speech, he only referred to war once. Um, and right before he spoke, you heard about or maybe listened to if you watch Democracy Now! or listen. How many of you listen to or watch Democracy Now? Well, that's awesome. I'm just going to take off my dress. Um, uh, and I hope all the rest of you do go to democracynow.org or tune in right here um, in Asheville. Or if you're not from Asheville, just go to democracynow.org and check out the station that's in your town and see if it's on our map. And if it's not, ask them to run Democracy Now. We're on, as Wally was saying, over 1,100 stations now. And it is growing by the week. We have a huge um, PBS campaign and scores of PBS stations, the biggest in the country, have picked us up. Because you know we're trying to put the public back in public media, hearing people like Rose. I thought it was so touching what Rosie's husband also said as they stood there in the pouring rain. Um, I asked, you know, why he is standing there in the rain about to get arrested. And he says, I am undocumented. I've been living here for 18 years. I paid taxes and I'm paying more taxes than Citibank. They were just outside of Citibank. <laughs> this undocumented immigrant paying more taxes than Citibank and possibly more than Romney. I'm not sure. Because it revealed um, how much he's paid in taxes. Um, but we need to hear the people who are at the target end of U.S. policy. Because, well, this goes to the title of our book, and I really want to thank Dennis, without whom this book would never be possible. The columns would never be possible. As we sat down with this first editor six years ago in a cafe in Chinatown in New York, and I was saying, I don't know how I could possibly, every single week, I don't know. And Dennis saying, yes, we can do this, we can do this. And so, you know, the idea is to have a column in the mainstream newspaper papers of this country is to provide a roadmap to other places people can go to hear independent voices and to infuse the editorial pages of the surviving newspapers of this country with different points of view. They're supposed to be a kind of, I hate to use the military term, battleground or just fertile uh, fertile grounds for discussion and debate. And I actually think that newspapers would have a better chance of surviving if they really did open up and provide that space for honest, open, authentic, and diverse discourse. And so that's why we decided to do this. Um, Breaking the Sound Barrier. This book is called The Silenced Majority. Because I really do think that those who are deeply concerned about war and about torture, those who are concerned about privacy issues and corporate control, who are concerned about inequality in this country, are not a fringe minority, not even a silenced majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the corporate media, which is why we have to take it back. Um, and as we travel this country, the way we take it back is shoring up independent media and bringing out the voices of people who you don't usually hear or telling their stories until they can tell their own. For example, like Rosie and Martine are in jail to let people know, to tell them what they had to say until they come out, and they have. They have been released. Um, these movements are what is making such an enormous difference. On the first day of the Democratic Convention, we went to the Levine Museum of the New South. I think it's been called the New South for a century. But, um, and I learned about the incredible history of Charlotte and North Carolina overall. Um, I mean, Charlotte, one of the first lunch counter sit-ins, and they have a whole, yeah, I encourage you to go to this museum, this whole lunch counter area, and also a bus before Board of Edu uh, Brown versus Board of Education, a seminal decision leading to that. But the lunch counter sit-in, first it was Greensboro, right? And it was the Woolworths counter, and that inspired people in Charlotte. I don't know, maybe someone's here who was involved at that time in 1960. Uh, truly amazing as people sat down. In fact, they were the 
young, just like the undocumented dreamers. It was young people from Johnson C. Smith College, from the historically black college, who marched to Charlotte and went in uh, into uh, the, into the lunch counter, sat down, and refused to get up and did it in a nonviolent way, even as they got spat on and beaten. You know, we have to remember this time, 1960. It's not as if they had the support even of their elders, let alone the white community, because the elders of the civil rights movement didn't think it was the time or the place. It would be dangerous and be patient, they said. Be patient. But these kids we weren't patient and they changed the world. Um, and to you know, know that history now of 1960, and to see these young people, immigrants, the new civil rights movement of this country, doing the very same thing, when so many parents across the country are saying, don't do it, don't come out of the shadows. I mean, you're just gonna get us all in trouble. This country isn't ready for this yet. Um, which brings me to other immigrants in this country, and not immigrants, people born here, but who happen to be Muslim, and what has happened um, um, over the last year since 9-11. I don't know if you heard about the Associated Press series. Um, they won the Pulitzer Prize this year for their series, exposing the New York Police Department for spying on Muslims uh, throughout the East Coast, and it may well have been beyond. Um, <clears throat> We've had them on Democracy Now!, the reporters, and also the targets. We had a young uh, Muslim City College student in New York come on. His parents said, do not go on television or the radio. And he said, I already see from the documents that AP got under the Freedom of Information Act that I have been named. So I think my best protection is actually to speak out publicly. And so we had him on, and he talked about, and he saw it in the documents from the New York Police Department, you know, he and his friends had gone on a weekend camping trip, and the provocateur, the infiltrator, was the one who drove them to the camping trip. He had become a part of their group, an intimate part of their group, so it's also a big personal betrayal when this kind of thing happens. Um, and he said, but they were, um, you know, he said they wrote us up and they talked about how we were so extreme that we prayed four times a day. And he said, I mean, they're so stupid, they don't know that we prayed five times a day. <laughs> but this is of grave concern, the surveillance, the level of militarization of the police in this country since 9-11. I mean, local police departments have gotten billions of dollars, tanks, um, LRAD sound machines that make you throw up that, you know, this high-pitched sound. We saw them brought out in Tampa. Um, uh, they didn't use them, but they brought them out. And these opportunities, these events, like the conventions, provide the excuse to further militarize the police. Now, we have uh, the Posse Comitatus Act in the United States, which I think most people agree with, the, the idea that we don't allow soldiers to march through the streets of the United States. States. But the way the authorities are getting around this is by militarizing the police. And it is very frightening. It's very painful for many people when you're at the target end. We've certainly seen it with the Occupy movement in this country. I mean, unprecedented number of arrests that we've ever seen in this country. And the Brooklyn Bridge after Occupy Wall Street started, 700 people among them, many reporters are just kettled. You know, they were um, surrounded by the police suddenly when they thought the police were leading them onto the bridge. And then when they got there, they were just surrounded and all arrested on mass. This is also a grave concern to us as New Yorkers, because we have to pay when the lawsuits, one by one, are won by the people who are wrongfully arrested. Um, that's just one aspect of it. We pay in a much dearer way. 
Um, when the conventions were being announced you know, in the last few weeks, do you remember hearing that uh, they fear that anarchists will use IEDs in the streets of Tampa? You know, if you're sane and you have kids, you'd say, you're not going there, right? Or you're a young person and you start to think, well, I mean, maybe it's not that important. I don't want to, I mean, I want to give my life for my country, but I don't know if I want to do it right now in that way, you know, get blown up. I mean, this is, and so that justifies the level of militarization. And you don't have to just take it from me. Norm Stamper, you know, Dennis was talking about uh, the Battle of Seattle in 1999 which became a model for all of us. He was the police chief, Norm Stanton. And this is when indie media really rose uh, in a way, just blossomed when indiemedia.org was getting more hits than CNN.com, because CNN.com was parroting the line of uh, Chief Stanford. We said, no, we're not using rubber bullets. We're not using this pepper spray and pepper gas. And, but we were just picking them up by the handfuls. You know, 90% of life is just showing up. You just take pictures of them. Um, and people understood where the authentic media really was. But now, Norm Stamper says, it's the greatest mistake of his life. He had hundreds of people arrested, high school kids, union activists, teachers, nurses, doctors, farmers, all came to the streets of Seattle to peacefully protest the idea that this um, super na national institution, the WTO, the World Trade Organization, um, could overturn the laws of democratically elected legislatures. Like if you said, we don't want, we want to pass a law that says no GMO foods in our community. Well, they would say that is uh, WTO illegal because then you are presenting a barrier to trade. And people were saying, no, 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 we're not going to do it this way. We're not going to allow these huge institutions to decide that our legislatures cannot make the laws of our land. And so people from every walk of life came, and there was Chief Stamper having their protests stamped out. He's deeply ashamed of this now. And he is leading the movement to stop the militarization. He said, my God, what did I do? He said, we so kitted out our police then. I mean, you know, they, sometimes they don't only have she face shields and, you know, total black robocop outfits, but they have shields that go from the above their heads to the ground, and they just move forward as a moving wall against peaceful protesters who could be their neighbors who could be their neighbor's kids. And he said, we so remove ourselves from the protesters that terrible things can happen. They truly do become the enemy in a kind of warlike sense. And we had Norm Stamper on Democracy Now! speaking to us from Washington State, as well as a spokesperson for the Police Foundation, who had organized a conference call of all the police chiefs in the various Occupy cities. And he came on, and he said this under my he said, I'm so proud to be here with Chief Stanford, because you really provided the model for what we're doing today with the Occupy protests. And Norm is saying, no, I am the opposite. Let me be the, the reverse model. This is what you should not do. And made a serious mistake. Um, and, you know, we experienced this in a very real way in 2008 at the Republican Convention in St. Paul. Um, we had just flown in from the parties in, uh, in Denver covering the Democratic Convention, and we went to cover the Republican Convention, and uh, my colleagues and I got arrested simply covering the protests. And I don't know if I've been here since then um, and described this, but this is just happening increasingly, and we certainly certainly have seen this in the last year. You go after the protesters and you go after the people who document these protests. And, um, and then you don't need outright censorship of the networks because the word will just never get there to be censored to begin with. Mm -hmm. And let me describe what happened to us then. It was just four years ago, September 1st, 2008. It was Labor Day, the first day of the Republican Convention. They were dealing with the same thing. They were dealing with a hurricane that could hit Katrina that could hit um, New Orleans that day, and the Republicans didn't want to be partying when people were drowning or dealing with this kind of pain, so they're having all these weather 
conferences and summits, and we were going off to them in St. Paul, um, and they were deciding whether to cancel the first day of the convention. But um, on the first day in St. Paul, it was a beautiful blue sky day. And it was Monday morning, a Labor Day. 10,000 people marched for peace, and they were led by soldiers, some in full military regalia, who had served in Iraq and Afghanistan, or who had served in one place, didn't want to go to the other, or had refused to serve, and other soldiers who were not in uniform. It's a big untold story that must be told, a level of resistance in the military today. Uh, so often it is the case that people have been on the front lines are the ones who are most opposed to what is happening because they see reality on the ground. Um, and so there were thousands of civilians as well, and they marched from St. Paul City Hall to the Excel Center in St. Paul. And we were covering the protest, talking to people, why are you out here? Um, it was hardly a risky situation. And then I went to the convention floor to interview delegates from the hottest state, from Alaska. And, and this was 2008, right? John McCain, two days before, had uh, introduced Sarah Palin as his running mate. Um, and our, my colleagues, uh, Sharif abdel Kadus and Nicole Salazar, two Democracy Now! producers, uh, went to uh, the Democracy Now! TV studios we were using in St. Paul to digitize tape. You know, you know, how many of you know Sharif from his reporting on the Egyptian Revolution, just the amazing work that he has done? and continues to do. Sharif flew in, um, we're actually at the Sundance Film Festival, you know, broadcasting the voices of the subjects and the directors of independent films. It was two years ago in 2010. And, um, uh, or 2011, the beginning of 2011. And all of a sudden, word came, Sharif was getting texts, he was getting emails, he was getting calls from all of his family. He's from, uh, Egypt. He's from a very illustrious family in Egypt. His grandfather's the most famous writer of Egypt, Hassan Abdel Kadus. And his cousins, you know, some who he said were apolitical, who uh, were writing, you know, I will die for my country. So I'm like, what are you talking about? Be like, this is not the Egypt I know that I grew up in, he said. And he realized something massive was happening, and this was happening fast. And so he flew out from Park City, landed in New York. We co hosted the show from Park City and New York. And we started with the sounds of the streets of Tahrir, and I said, no, this is not a film. This is the real thing, and it's happening now. This is real time, and it's happening in Cairo, Egypt, and Alexandria, and all throughout, um, increasingly through the Middle East. And he flies home. And you know, Democracy Now! is a very scrappy news organization. We started 16 years ago as the only daily election show in public broadcasting, and uh, we had very little money and financial support. We started in radio, and we would, and we immediately started on the web as well, because it was the least expensive way to transfer broadcast quality audio to other radio stations. They could just take it off of the web. The network started to look at us as a model. We once had someone in who was working on a Fox website to help us with ours, and we said, you know, what are you know what are you doing behind the scenes? He said, oh, we're just watching you guys because you are so far ahead. Of us. <laughs> <laughs> at least it was not for watching us for other reasons. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure of that too. But um, uh, so we needed the internet from the beginning, and we developed, pioneered a way to send broadcast quality video over the internet because the satellites are very expensive. We sometimes use them around the world. Um, you know, it's perfect quality, but we can do it through the internet as well. Necessity is the mother of invention. When Sharif flew into Cairo and just basically helicoptered into Tahrir, Mubarak had taken down the internet at that point. And you know, he, Sharif, jokes that, um, he said, you know, we're Egyptian. He said, it was Mubarak's greatest mistake. He said, he said we would be inside our houses doing Facebook and being on the internet, but Mubarak took it down, so we all have to go outside to figure out what's happening. <laughs> so, uh, he takes down the internet, Mubarak, you know, throws the country into digital darkness, and Sharif figures out a way to tweet around uh, the uh, blockade, and he becomes one of the top tweeters in the world, and his tweets are being featured on CNN, and he's being interviewed on MSNBC night and day, um, and they're pointing to the tweets, and they're showing, who is this Sharif? And, um, you know, I call it trickle-up journalism. <laughs> but his 
Yates, and then Mubarak, you know, restored the internet. He did it with the help of uh, U.S. corporations, by the way, um, where they would just turn the switch. The dictator couldn't do it himself, and he needed corporate responsibility, uh, corporate uh, collaboration, and they def they defended themselves. It's Naros, it's a California-based company, by saying we were simply following orders, but I, I'd heard that before, and it didn't <laughs> turn out very well. Um, so when he restored the internet, he took down, the thugs took down the satellites. And that's when the big networks started to be in big trouble. Because I remember seeing Anderson Cooper on CNN, and he was in his hotel room, and it said the lower third was reporting from an undisclosed location. He looked like he was sort of under the covers. And there was Sharif saying his name, saying where he was in the middle of Tupper Square, uh, saying this is the safest place to be in Egypt right now, broadcasting to the world. And his power was, not just his voice, though he is a son of Egypt, and that made it ever more eloquent and real, um, bringing out the voices of people at the grassroots. So you met Adef Suef, the great Egyptian writer who wrote Map of Love. You met um, Nawal Sadawi, at the time 79 years old, who had run for president in Egypt, had been imprisoned under Sadat, exiled under Mubarak. She was a physician. She was a writer. She was holding salons with young people leading up to the revolution. And as they were saying, we just, how are we going to do this? We can't break through shit. We will win this young woman, pure white hair. In fact, after the, um, uh, the beginning of the revolution, she actually came to New York. And uh, we were going to interview her on Democracy Now! And the morning she was coming in, there was a tsunami in Japan. Remember what happened? And oh my God, here's this great woman, Nawal Sadawi, and she's in New York. We had talked to her on the phone and talked to her and everything, and she's coming into the studio. This is such a big deal for us. And now we had to cancel her because we had to deal with the tsunami just that day. But she wasn't going to be in New York after that. We have to. We were going to do what we call a post show. We would interview her right after the show so that we could broadcast it in the days after. We had it. We were a news show, and we had to deal with this tsunami that was taking such a terrible toll in Japan. So, oh, uh, God bless all the producers of Democracy Now! I can't remember which person uh, had the responsibility of calling the wall to say, could you come an hour later? Because, well, and she's on the phone and you can hear the wall enraged. And she's saying, I'm so sorry, Mrs. Dawi. Uh, <coughs> and she said, I'm sorry. It's just, we have this breaking news that we have to deal with today because there is this tsunami. And she is screaming, my whole life is a tsunami. <laughs> heard her in Top Rear because Sharif and Hani Masood, Hani is also Egyptian-American. I just left him a few hours ago. He was covering the conventions with us. Um, and he was on the Egyptian national basketball team and everything. There, He can leap tall buildings in a single bound. Uh, and he was the videographer with Sharif. And they were filming all of these remarkable people. The teenage girl who was putting out a broadsheet in the middle of Tahrir um, of the voice called Voices of Tahrir in the, um, in the shadow of the state media building that had spewed so many lies for so many decades. And you were meeting this cross-section of Egyptian society that could have been your family, that could have been your community, people you used to agree with, people you didn't agree with, but everyone together in top <laughs> It's very symbolic and meaningful that in any other place I would have been handed uh, a, a, a plastic bottle of water. I mean, uh, you know, a bottle of water, but here we have something very nice. Um, did someone check this before? I took a sip then. I feel much safe now. So uh, here are all of these voices that you're getting on video. And the satellites were down. We were using satellites too then. But 
we knew a different way to get the information out that the networks don't use, and that we, for so many years, have sent this broadcast quality video through the internet. So as Sharif was in top rear, Hani would race over the camels and the people and the barricades back to Sharif's house, and he would put together these voices, and you get these glorious 20, 25 minute reports of people on the ground day after day. And it became something that was so real, that became so possible, so personal. Um, that's the power of independent media, people speaking for themselves, that breaks down barriers. You know, I come originally from Pacifica Radio that was founded more than 60 years ago in Berkeley, California. A war resistor named Lou Hill came out of the detention camps after World War II. And uh, he said there's got to be a media outlet that's not run by corporations that profit from war. And so KPFA was founded in Berkeley, California in 1949. You know, not found. You know, not founded by, uh, not run by corporations that profit from war, but run by journalists and artists, as George Gerbner, the late dean at the Annenberg School of Communications, University of Pennsylvania, said. <clears throat> not run by corporations that have nothing to tell and everything to sell that are raising our children today. And then KPFK went on the air in 1959 in Los Angeles, my station in New York, WBAI in 1960. <clears throat> um, 1977 WPFW in Washington, 1970 KPFT in Houston, 1970. Uh, it's the only radio station in the country. It went on the air in the spring of 1970 and it was blown up immediately. Only radio station in the country to be blown up. Um, the Ku Klux Klan strapped dynamite to the base of the transmitter and blew it to smithereens. Um, you know, the silver lining was, it's not as if they had money to advertise that they were this new radio station in the Petro Petro of Houston. Um, uh, but, you know, this explosion exploded it into the consciousness of the potential listening audience of Houston. They got back on their feet, uh, they rebuilt their transmitter, and it was in the middle of Arlo Guthrie singing Alice's Restaurant that the plan blew it up again. <laughs> I can't remember if it was the Grand Dragon or Exalted Cyclops, because I often can <laughs> He said it was his proudest act, because he understood how dangerous Pacifica is, how dangerous independent media is, because it allows people to speak for themselves. And when you hear Nawal Sadawi or Adef Suef, or you hear a Palestinian child, or an Israeli grandmother, or if only we could hear Rachel Corey today, mm. that incredibly brave young peace activist, 23 years old, who should have graduated from Evergreen College in the largest graduating class. I remember her class so well. I was invited to give the graduation address the year she was supposed to graduate. Um, but instead, she was in Gaza. Um, she had decided to go for a few months to help the people there, the Palestinians. She became very close to a pharmacist family. And when an Israeli military bulldozer came to bulldoze this row of houses that included the pharmacist family, um, she stood up. The Israeli military bulldozer was made by Caterpillar here in the United States. You know, she's a kid. She's a young human rights activist. She was writing to her parents about what she was doing. She believed that peace for the Palestinians meant peace for the Israelis. And she hoped she could be some kind of bridge. And she put on that orange, like workers, construction workers, wear the orange vest, the fluorescent vest, so she would be seen. And with a few other peace activists, she took out a, bull, a uh, bullhorn uh, to meet the bulldozer to stand there to say no to the decimating of this family. It's not just house, but home. And the Israeli military bulldozer crushed her to death. It not only ran over her going forward, but then ran over her going back. 
this is very much on my mind. I remember March 16, 2003, it was a few days before the U.S. invaded and bombed Iraq. And I remember hearing the word that this young woman from Washington State had just been killed by the Israeli military. Um, Rachel Corey's parents will not let her story, her words, her hopes die. And they sued the Israeli military, and they were just in Haifa and democracy now during the Republican convention because the court decision came down. They didn't want money. They wanted an acknowledgment of what they did, and the judge ruled no, um, that the Israeli military was not responsible for her death. I urge you to go to democracynow.org to meet Rachel Corey, to hear her story. We have covered it many times in the video of her speaking before, talking to her friends. It's all there at democracynow.org. But I wish you could hear Rachel Corey's voice, or Palestinian children, Israeli grandmothers, aunts from Afghanistan, uncles from Iraq. Because I really do think when you hear someone speaking for themselves, it breaks down barriers, challenges, stereotypes, and caricatures that fuel the groups that are so rampant today and have also so defined our country, though I do think there's a force more powerful, and it is the pro-democracy movements in this country that have organized, like the civil rights movement, like the immigrants' rights movement. I want to tell you an interesting story about Mitt Romney and David Koch for just a minute, because it makes me think of this when we talk about civil rights. How many of you listened to or watched our coverage of the Republican convention? Uh, Mike Burke, our senior producer, who went to try to question Sheldon Adelson. Everyone go to the website to check this out. So, you know, we have a job as journalists, and it's to follow the money. And I was just surprised that Mike wasn't in a long line of journalists um, who had much better equipment and who were much better positioned and had higher levels of Bank of America and Time Warner credentials, um, that he would be at the tail end. Uh, but no, he was the only reporter who would happen to be there in the court corporate suites that afternoon when Sheldon Adelson was coming through. And he went up to Mr. Adelson. You know who he is. He is the casino magnate um, who runs uh, the Venetian, which was the Sands and, uh, in Las Vegas, and Macau Casino has been investigated for bribery and all of that. But he's the one who gave New Gingrich millions of dollars, and then though he didn't like him as much, ultimately, as giving Mitt Romney, or in through super packs, just promised to give a hundred million dollars. It's very scary when a couple of billionaires can determine the elections of a democratic uh, country. Um, but that's Sheldon Anderson, certainly someone we should question. He has a big influence on all of our lives. And so Mike asked him, you know, how much are you planning to spend in this election? And they're walking along. He and Hani, right? Hani, who had uh, covered uh, the Egyptian revolution. So Hani's a big, tall guy, and he's got his camera, and he's following Mike. And before Mike knew it, there was a woman who was between uh, Adelson and Mike, and she stepped back and pushed her body into Mike, knocking him uh, off balance. He didn't even have any idea who this young woman was. And uh, Hani is just filming. You know, when you film, you're very single focused, and you're just one eye is looking, and he is filming, and he is seeing this happen all of a sudden. Yet what he doesn't realize is this woman grabs his camera and starts running into the Adelson sweet. And Hani is completely surprised. And he he goes to get his camera, and he's reaching, he puts his foot in the door of the suite, and he said to her, what are you doing? And she drops the camera. And then Mike, they have nothing now, so he pulls out his, uh, his phone to take pictures, and they try to grab his phone out of his hand. I mean, they were simply asking a question about how much money the Adelsons were planning to pour into these elections. That is a critical question to ask. And the Adelsons, maybe more than most people in this country, uh, appreciate private property. So they understood exactly what was going on with them taking uh, their private property. So then security came out, Mike saying, what is going on here? I mean, this woman has, I said, that is Adelson's daughter. 
Mrs. This is Sheldon Addison's daughter, who was grabbing the equipment, throwing it on the ground. Um, they didn't cover up for her at all. Um, it was extremely embarrassing for all of them. And uh, Addison's daughter then came out and oddly apologized several times. And then the uh, family, tr at, at first, it was they tried to put out that there was this altercation. Um, but the Allisons were very smart, and the next day they put out a statement saying, we think it's very important that all reporters, you know, uh, be peaceful, and yet we believe in the practice of free press. You see, they said all reporters, because they knew they could not accuse the Democracy Now! reporters. And so by saying that, it would make it seem like they weren't, but they weren't accusing them, because they knew full well we had the videotape of exactly what had happened. Uh, but the media so often takes the word of those in power. But this time, I would not say that happened. Political, even Glenn Beck uh, put on his website exactly what had taken place. So that's Mike trying to follow uh, the money, right? Then I am walking along the aisle. This sort of looks like the Republican convention, but there are thousands of people that go, you know, these are the aisles of it. And this aisle has Utah and Wisconsin, and you guys over there are New York, the New York delegation. And I see that David Polk is in the New York delegation. He's a delegate from New York, very tall, Man. He and his brother, Charles Koch, uh, promising to give something like $400 million in this election cycle. They're the funders of the Tea Party. Um, and now Mitt Romney. And now this is very important to ask them a question. And my question as I went over to ask him was, do you think unchecked, um, concentrated wealth is subverting democracy? <laughs> this question, every delegate around him, this is my delegation, it's the New York, I mean, in the biggest sense, I'm not talking about the parties, but they're from New York. Every person around him stands up. He's a very tall guy. He's taller than any of them. He's about six foot, I don't know, three, six foot five. But they all stand up around him to protect him, and then all the security comes to protect him. And I've got my microphone out, and he is cowering. <laughs> Uh, hiding behind them, go to our website, democracy.org, and just see the picture of him. You see just one of them. And, um, and they're, they're all around standing up. Um, and the guy next to him, who is on the aisle, I see, because you know we all have to wear our, the, they all are wearing their names, is Ed Cox. So I said, oh, you know, Ed Cox, and I know who Ed Cox is. He is the son-in-law of Richard Nixon, right? He married, uh, he's Trisha Cox's husband. And, um, and he is the chair of the Republican Party of New York, you know, the first line of defense for Mr. Koch. So I said, okay, I, I've got my mic right there. What do you think, Mr. Cox? Um, do you think unchecked concentrated wealth is subverting democracy? And he said, no, I don't. And he actually did, did respond. Um, and then they pushed me out of there. Uh, but now I want to describe the last night of the convention, the story if you watch television. I don't know. I bet most of you don't watch the networks. I do a lot. But I want to talk about what millions of people didn't see, the romney Coke handshake, and what we were able to bring you exclusively on Democracy Now! Me and John Hamilton, he was my videographer for the last night of the convention. And we were, I knew that row very well because I had interviewed Governor Walker. He was right here in the front. Um, and he was sitting, and I went up to him to ask him about reproductive rights and about public unions and why did he see teachers as the enemy. Um, I, which is huge embarrassment for the Republicans right before the convention. Um, not because of just who Todd Aiken is, but very significant because he's running against Claire McCaskill, who's the senator from Missouri, and she was very vulnerable, and Todd Aiken was ahead, a former state legislator. Um, and when asked in a local TV interview um, about why, uh, about why there weren't exceptions for rape and incest when talking about abortion. And he said uh, that, you know, well, women's bodies shut down. They don't get pregnant uh, when they are legitimately raped. Uh, and 
and this was, you know, this was caught on videotape, and it got out there, and the Republican Party wanted to distance itself from. Why? Because so much of what Paul Ryan has supported, and not just supported, sponsored so much of the legislation, he has done with Todd Aiken, and it's so similar. They together sponsored legislation about forcible rape. Is there another kind of rape? <laughs> But it is a whole, it comes from a whole school of thought. It's very deliberate. Now it's very embarrassing for Paul Ryan. They were very vulnerable. This also shows just the power of women, and particularly young women, speaking out right now. That they are in such a And Dennis and I wrote our column on Paul Ryan. Um, uh, you know, Mitt Romney, it's very hard to pin him down on any particular thing. You know, and he changes his position so quickly. I mean, you know that on the issue of choice, he and Ann Romney were absolute supporters of choice for years. We interviewed Rocky Anderson, who's running against him on the Justice Party ticket. Rocky Anderson is former mayor of Salt Lake City and was very close to Mitt Romney and Ann Romney. And, um, uh, you know, he, he would have them for dinner. They cross-endorsed because uh, Rocky was a Democrat and Romney, of course, was a Republican. So when he ran for governor of Massachusetts, Rocky Anderson did a commercial for him and Romney endorsed him as mayor. They worked together on the Olympics. They were good friends. And he says the change on almost all issues is so shocking. And this isn't like a kid who changes their views as they grow up. And everyone is entitled to change their views. But the rapidity with which, and you know, his one of his campaign managers said it very clearly. We see this, you know, as his views of the past, we just look at it as these etch-a-sketch moments. We just erase them. And that's not us saying it, it's his people saying it. Um, and so on Planned Parenthood, they were funding Planned Parenthood in Massachusetts. His mother, Romney's mother, is very interesting. Um, she's a big supporter of choice, a big supporter of Planned Parenthood, and had a big influence on Mitt uh, Romney. Um, and his father, I mean, look at the Koch brothers' family and look at um, Romney's family. I'll talk about that in a minute because I have to give you this picture of the last night. Uh, that, sorry, I'm rambling a bit. But, so I was talking to Governor Walker about reproductive rights, and I said, Said, you know, about women's concern about reproductive rights, and he said that is ridiculous. You know, and Scott Walker's Wisconsin, Paul Ryan's Wisconsin, they share many of the same views. Um, and he said it's ridiculous. He said women don't care about reproductive rights; they care about the economy. And then I started to see that that was sort of the meme of the whole conference, of the convention, because um, about six rows back was Utah, and there was Senator Orrin Hatch. And so I went up to him and I said, "What about women's?" You know, the Hatch Amendment, you know, this is, they don't talk as much about abortion, but they're very focused on women's reproductive rights. And I said to him, uh, Senator Hatch, what do you think about women's concern about um, uh, freedom to control their own destiny and their own bodies, about reproductive rights? And he says, it's ridiculous. I asked my wife, she doesn't care about reproductive rights, she cares about the economy. And I started to hear this everywhere, except from the Abe Lincoln lookalike. Um, he was amazing, George uh, Engelbach. Uh, I don't know if you saw him. He looks exactly like Abe Lincoln. <laughs> and he dresses like Abe Lincoln. So, you know, all the media was interviewing him. I mean, you walk by and you go, oh my God. So, I mean, I had this moment where Abe Lincoln's walking by. So I did go up to him and I said, Mr. Lincoln, what's happened to your party? And. Uh, <laughs> he said, um, so we started to talk, and I was surprised the media didn't have a real, he really is a real delegate from Missouri. He is actually Todd Aiken's colleague in the state legislature. And I said, what do you think of what he said about you know this whole issue of legitimate rape? And he said, I mean, I believe in forgiveness, and I, you know, I think uh, if he misspoke or whatever, he should be forgiven. I mean, if someone did not mean something, I also agree that if they don't, I agree with that, if they don't mean it. So I said, well, um, and he said something about, you know, uh, it's very important to, uh, you know, he said, but it's not as if uh, women who suffer from brutal rapes get pregnant. Oh. 
And I said, are you quoting Todd Aiken? And she said, no. He said, it's well known that there is, you know, I mean, medically, scientifically, that when women, and this is very interesting, because when we were going to Tampa, we saw that there's going to be this huge hurricane. So we were in the newsroom of Democracy Now! And I said, oh my God, there's going to be this big hurricane. And Steve Martinez, our videographer, said, is it a legitimate hurricane? Yeah. <laughs> Said, said not to worry, because if, if it is, uh, Tampa will shut down. And so, so anyway, I'm talking to Abe Lincoln, and he says, you know, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, it's not as if, if it was a brutal rape for woman. Oh my gosh, this is excellent. <laughs> And he's, yeah, so, uh, he said, it's not as if it was a So I said, is there any other kind of rape? <laughs> and, and he said, well, yes. You know, if a girl or a, or a lady is, uh, is inebriated, oh, you listen, okay, is inebriated, or, you know, or, you know, is high on drugs, or, uh, you know, you, or you, slip her a, you slip her a mickey. <laughs> walking up and down the aisle, but when Mitt Romney uh, made his entrance and no one knew where he would be, he was coming down that aisle, and John and I were over here, we were in the, I think it was the New Hampshire delegation, we were standing, and you know, then it's a huge crush when the actual candidate comes down, and I couldn't even look over at where he was, but I saw on the, uh, on the big video screen, because they were showing him, coming down, coming down, and I could tell by the outfits people were wearing and by, you know, being Lauren Hatch, and I was, oh my God, he's coming down that aisle. I knew every single person on this aisle. I've been roaming it for the last few days. And I certainly knew when I saw the sign for New York, where he was headed next. Uh, right next to the big sign for New York was David Pope. He was no longer cowering behind a cops, but he was towering over everyone else. He is a tall man. And as Mitt Romney came down the aisle and was saying to John, film the video, film the video screen. You know, just get, he said, no, you know, we get this from Reuters later on. We'll just, New York will pick it up. I said, just film it. You just never know, just film what is up there right now. Because that's the only way I could see what's happening. And he comes down the aisle and he comes up to David Koch. He puts his arm, okay, and we, you can stop, you can roll it back. You see, there he is. Yeah. And Cox is right there. And I think I show it again in one second. Uh, here we go. Um, there he is. He puts his arm on David Koch, and he uh, shakes his hand, and then he uh, points at him. Fine. Now we're going to roll this back, because that's what happens. It's okay. He shook his hand. So we'll just show that tomorrow. We'll illustrate the relationship with Koch, Romney, and Koch. Handshake. Fine. So we call up Robbie Karen, our uh, videographer in New York, who's going to be up all night choosing the video, and we get international feeds that all the networks get. We said, Robbie, take the entrance of Romney, and um, when he gets the New York delegation, I don't know if Robbie knew who David Koch was, I want you to make sure you pull that, because we're going to show it tomorrow and talk about you know, the relationship. And so he said, what do you mean? He said, no, he doesn't do that. He doesn't shake a tall guy's hand. I said, no, no, just look carefully. You see the New York poll, and, um, and then keep going. And I said, just take it. Now, keep showing this. This might be before or after. Oh, right here. OK. So he said, no, it's these two young women, and they have these sort of boa, red, white, and blue scarves. And then they show a big shot, he said, of the, of the convention. That's what they do. And then they go back to him shaking hands. This five seconds would have sent out to the rest of the world. They cut away, and you don't see what we were actually seeing on the inside of the hall, not just me with my own eyes, but on the video screen. So they had the video. I am not saying this was deliberate. Uh, we, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. This is what you're not getting. There's New York, you see in the corner, and you see these women. And um, so we immediately called our reporters and we said, who provided the video feed to you? Because they provided it to us. Who provided 
the video feed, and they said NBC provides it to us. You see, we have pool feeds, and each time, either CBS or NBC, ABC, they're sort of responsible because they want all the cameras there for the feed, and they give it out to all of us. But the question is, who provided it to NBC? Was it NBC choosing what would be shown, or was it the RNC sending you know, to a box that then NBC took out? That I still have to find out. But what I do know is, as you see Mitt Romney very excited on that side, shaking the hand of David Koch, um, we see two young, very excited women. Um, <laughs> They're uh, uh, cheerleading for the party that they believe in. And, you know, it just shows you have to be there. You have to be on the ground. And as media becomes more concentrated, and it is in the hands of fewer and fewer corporations, even though we have great diversity of sources of information, uh, these images are being increasingly controlled. Even in this day and age, when you have lots of cameras there, what people actually see. And this is very significant. And so we, uh, this Coke Romney handshake went viral, the video that you didn't see. Um, and let me just quickly talk about how things have changed and how ironic family stories can be. I've been doing a lot of investigation of the Koch family and the Romney family. Now, Mitt Romney's father, George, who was the governor of Michigan, was a very honorable man. Um, he was going to run against Goldwater, Mary Goldwater, in 1964. He went to the convention and was deeply concerned about extremism in the Republican Party. Um, he was particularly concerned that Goldwater was opposed to civil rights and to the civil rights legislation. He said, this is a tragic error for our party to be opposed to this, and really concerned about the John Birch Society, really concerned about this racist, segregationist John Birch Society that was founded uh, in Wisconsin and warned against racism and extremism in 1964 and walked away from the convention, never gave Goldwater his support which was considered very unsportsmanlike, but refused to do it and wrote him a many-page letter why he would not support him. This is Mitt Romney's father. The Koch brothers' father is Fred Koch, and he's co-founder of the John Birch Society. Um, uh, in Wisconsin, and uh, here now their uh, children, right, Mitt and David Koch, have come together, and uh, it's just very interesting to understand that history. It's also interesting when looking at the Occupy movement, you know, first Tunisia, then Egypt, and then that sparked Wisconsin. Well, Governor Walker helped when he was elected and then went after the public unions in this amazing moment, the largest protests in Wisconsin. In history, and I went to cover these protests, and the police and the firefighters were sleeping in the Capitol net alongside the nurses and the teachers because even though Walker said, I'm not going after the police and the firefighters, they said, if you're going after the nurses and the teachers, you're going after us. And I had never seen... You'd see outside Walker's office kids with Rasta hair beating drums and police rocking out. <laughs> um, and uh, I talked to police in New York who were tear gassing and going after and kettling the young protesters at Occupy Wall Street and said, you know, it doesn't have to be this way. I mean, look at the police of Wisconsin. When I asked Governor Walker about this, I said, you know, your police did not side with you. They sided with the teachers and the nurses, and he said they had to have been outsiders. So well, they were in the Madison Police Department, and we were in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, but 150,000 people marched on freezing cold days in Wisconsin, and I don't think we've seen the end of this kind of rebellion. Um, as I looked out on the crowd, there's this museum of labor across the street to show how profound these protests are. You know, as AFSCME among them who are protesting American Federation of State County Municipal Employees. And let's go back to 1968 when Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated in Memphis. You know why he was assassinated? He'd gone to Memphis to march with the sanitation workers who were simply trying to set up a local of AFSCME, Local 1707. Um, 
this just shows how powerful the organizing is today and that it reverberates with incredibly powerful movements of the past. And I think it's very important to look at um, these movements. The media denigrates movements, but we need a media that projects the voices of these movements. You never know when the magic moment comes, you know, September 17th, when the young people and older people sat down in uh, Zuccotti Park. You know, it's not as if they hadn't been protesting before, but there is this, these moments in time, and when it comes, if you're involved in social change, you will help build the foundation that will determine the future. Uh, I remember the media at this time. It was disgraceful. You know, September 17th, they sit down. Thousands of people are there in Zuccotti Park. First, the media does not cover them at all. Just silence. And then, when you just couldn't ignore it anymore, they ridiculed them. I remember Erin Burnett, who's on CNN, uh, she was on a program the day before her program debuted on CNN. And she said she's going to bring out the voices of all people, of all walks of life. That will, that will be the, her trademark. The first day of her program, she goes down to Occupy Wall Street, and the segment is called Seriously. So then they ridicule you. But it made me think about Mahatma Gandhi, right? First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. And we need a media that reflects these movements, which takes me to what happened in November of 2008. Uh, Barack Obama's elected president. No question, an historic moment in this country. You know, a land with a legacy of slavery elects the first African American president. I actually think the world heaved a sigh of relief on that day. For so long, people felt they were hitting their heads against a brick wall. That wall had now become a door. The door opened a crack, but the question is, would it be kicked open or slammed shut? And that's not up to that one person in the White House. It is up to people all over this country. It's up to movements. That move Movements elected Barack Obama. But I think what happened after he was elected, people were exhausted and people didn't want to contribute to the right wing backlash, you know, the birther movement, the whole othering of Barack Obama. Um, you know, he doesn't come from here, the whole question of the birth certificate. They didn't want to contribute to the right wing backlash. So when there were issues they cared about, like not continuing the longest war in U.S. history in Afghanistan or torture, he made a first promise he closed Guantanamo and then he didn't, all of these different issues, um, drone attacks, uh, going after whistleblowers. He's gone after more whistleblowers than all presidents in history combined, bringing them up on treason charges. I mean, this is a story that has also not been told very much in this country. These are top officials, for example, the National Security Agency, who are deeply concerned that this organization that's many times larger than the CIA is spying on the American people. They speak out and they are arrested. They are charged. And this is under President Obama. And if this were George Bush, you could be sure people would be marching in the streets, and there are some that are, with the drone attacks that are killing scores of people in Pakistan and uh, Yemen. Just recently, another drone attack. You know, when we were in Charlotte, people were holding up signs of um, Samir Khan. He's a young man who lived in Charlotte, North Carolina, who was just killed in a drone attack in Yemen with, uh, with a Lockheed. Um, these men have not been tried. They are just assassinated. Um, this is all under President Obama, and you know how you would feel if this were happening under President Bush, and President Bush could rightly feel a little bit ticked off um, that when he, you know, would do something like this, the people would take to the streets, where are they now? Um, that's a very good question. And you know, when President Obama is sitting in the Oval Office and those who are used to having the ear of the most powerful person on earth whisper in his ear, if he can't point out the window of the Oval Office and say, if I do that, they will storm the Bastille. If no one's out there, he's in big trouble. And that's when you agree with him. What about when you disagree with him? What is the role of movements today? Movements that have been so 
important in shaping this country, like the civil rights movement, like, uh, well, I think I've told the story, but it's such an amazing one, like, well, the story of Frederick Douglass, right? Frederick Douglass, the greatest abolitionist of all time, uh, born in the eastern shore of Maryland. After the Obamas uh, were, President Obama, after Barack Obama was elected president, but before he was inaugurated, they went to the White House to tour around it with the Bushes, and I was invited on CNN to talk about the significance of the moment, and I was on with other pundits around the country, and I saw the Obamas walking into the White House, but they asked me a question about something else. I said, wait a second, we have to take pause. This is an incredible moment. You have Barack Hussein Obama, Michelle LeVon Robinson Obama. She's the descendant of slaves. Their daughters, uh, Malia and Sasha, then are the descendants of slaves about to live in the White House, the most famous house on earth, which was built by slaves. We just have to take pause here. Um, and it made me think of Frederick Douglass. Just hours from the White House is another house. Frederick Douglass was imprisoned as a youth and a teenager. He um, was brought to this man named Ed Covey who was called a slave breaker because he was a troublesome slave, it might not surprise you to know. And he beat him. Uh, Covey beat Frederick Douglass. He tortured him. Uh, but Frederick Douglass broke away, headed north, and changed the world. Um, you know, started the North Star newspaper campaign against slavery, his voice so powerful he shook when he spoke because he had been enslaved himself. The place he was enslaved in St. Michael's, Maryland, Covey's plantation, was called Mount Misery. That plantation, that property, is now owned by Donald Rumsfeld. He bought it when he was Secretary of Defense in 2003 to be his vacation home, to be next to his close friend, Vice President Dick Cheney. Absolutely amazing. And when I learned about this, I raced to St. Michael's to see if it was true. And Dennis and I drove there. And, um, you know, I had known the story of Frederick Douglass. I go to this coffee house in New York, wonderful place in downtown Manhattan, this old brick building, and there is a plaque on the outside of it. It used to be an old printing press owned by David Ruggles, it says, a free black man born in Connecticut, and he had a printing press. And when Frederick Douglass came north and uh, took refuge, he take, took refuge in this building of the printing press, and I think of David Ruggles, Frederick Douglass, they saw the media as, as liberation, because information is power. Ultimately, it will free us all. Um, I see the media could be the greatest force for peace on earth, but instead it's wielded as a weapon of war. So back to this Mount Misery. I had no idea um, when I went down to St. Michael's where Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld lived, so I saw this organic coffee house in uh, St. Michael's, and I said to Dennis, they'll tell the truth. <laughs> so we went inside. <laughs> They said, what would you like? I said, I'd like to know where Donald Rumsfeld is. And they said, oh, you just go down the road. Don't go down Mount Pleasant Road, but you make a right and another right, and you'll hit Mount Misery Road, go to the end, and that's where you live. So we took the car, and we didn't go down Mount Pleasant Road, and we took a right and another right. It seemed we couldn't go right enough. So I got out quickly with a little video camera, and I'm zooming in as they're zooming out. And I'm thinking, does Donald Rumsfeld know the significance of this place? But sure enough, right there in the ground next to the driveway is a plaque, a stake in the ground that says Mount Misery. So we raced off then to the local black church, and folks were just um, were having Sunday school. And I asked the older folks in the sanctuary, do you know this? I asked this one woman, boy, this is such a historic place. The significance of this place, you have Frederick Douglass, who was enslaved, he was tortured at Mount Misery, you have Donald Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense, who's known for torture and Guantanamo. Um, uh, what do you say about this? And she said, I can't comment now, we're in church. <laughs> so from Mount Misery to Mount Hope, I was speaking up in Rochester, New York, and I told the story, and a young woman came up to me after it was in the middle of a snowstorm, and she said, will you come with me to Mount Hope Cemetery in Rochester tomorrow morning? I'd like to show you Frederick Douglass's tombstone. I said, oh my gosh, 
yes, except that I'm taking a flight to Denver in the morning. I can't miss a ship, please. And how could I say no? So I said, I met her at 5 in the morning or 4 in the morning outside the cemetery. We slid our way to Frederick Douglass's tombstone, brushing off the snowflake. He was amazing. And she said, please come with me to the other side of the cemetery. I want to show you another tombstone. I said, oh my god, I'm going to miss my flight. She said, please, OK, OK. So we go across the cemetery, and she shows me the tombstone of Susan B. Anthony, who's buried next to her sister. You know, Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass were not only um, allies, they were friends. And I was giving a talk at Wesleyan College, and a woman came up and said, and did you go to Susan B. Anthony's house? Because right next to it is a statue, not of a general, but of Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass having tea together. <laughs> So I raced off then to the airport and missed my plane. <laughs> so I called Dennis, absolutely desperate, and I say, Dennis, you've got to get me on the next plane. Could you please help me? And he brings up the blueprints of the airport on his computer. <laughs> this is why Dennis is so remarkable. He says, OK, are you in the Susan B. Anthony wing or the Frederick Douglass wing? <laughs> to kill me in Denver. I have to go and talk tonight. He said, I'm not kidding. I said, this is a small airport. What do you mean? And sure enough, I see there is one wing of the airport, and it says Susan B. Anthony, and the other, and it says Frederick Douglass. So every once in a while, I have to stop and smell the coffee. So um, I got on the next plane. But these movements, the civil rights movement, the abolition movement, the women's rights movement, Frederick Douglass was not only a great abolitionist, he was a great feminist. He seconded the resolution at the Seneca Falls 1848 Women's Rights Convention for women to have the right to vote. Susan B. Anthony not only was a great feminist, but she was a great abolitionist. And these are the movements that have made this country great. So you think about where we are today and a media that reflects all of these movements. Um, and I want to end with three points. One is what happened to us at the Republican Convention, which I started a while ago and never finished telling you. But uh, just very quickly, you probably know the story, but we, uh, my colleague Sharif Nicole and I got arrested, um, simply trying to cover the protest. Sharif does not get arrested by Mubarak in Egypt covering the revolution, but he gets arrested in St. Paul covering what are supposed to be these celebrations of democracy that are very well funded by taxpayers. You know that the new Republican slogan is, we built it, to mock President Obama saying, whatever you did in your life, whatever you built, remember that um, uh, government contributed to that, even if it was just the building of the highway that you used for to get your uh, truck to deliver whatever somewhere else. Um, and on this first night where every sign was we built it and all the walls said we built it. I was up filming the, uh, the high rollers who were drinking wine at the convention looking out from the skyboxes. And right there is the debt clock. They had one, the national debt, and the other, the, when they gaveled in the convention the first day, they started a debt clock. Um, and I could only think, I mean, Boeing has gotten billions of dollars in government subsidies. And you think about the people, the millions of dollars that the Koch brothers have gotten with their oil and other energy industries have government subsidies. And so many of the people who are there bankrolling these parts, and the same goes for the Democrats. And I could only think as that debt was going up, you know, every millisecond. Yes, it was very appropriate to see across the stadium, we built it. They built that debt. <laughs> So the arrest, 2008. Sharif doesn't get arrested as covering the revolution, but he does get arrested um, in the streets of St. Paul. He and Nicole were in their TV studios. I was down on the convention floor. They're digitizing tape. They hear a commotion outside. They run outside with video camera and microphone. They wouldn't have been doing their job if they didn't run outside. And they start filming the riot police and the protesters. And uh, Nicole is filming. She doesn't go out to film her own violent arrest, but that's exactly what happens. The riot police come at her in full riot gear. She's very much alone. She's up against cars because she's in a parking lot. And they're screaming at her, on your face, on your face. She's clearly a reporter. She is filming and she's shouting, press, press. And they're shouting back and she's showing her credential. They're saying, on your face. She didn't know what hit her. This is the first day, beautiful blue sky day, a 
the convention. They, they hit her from behind and in front, and they took her down on her face. And the first thing to go down is the camera tumbling down. They pulled the battery out if you want to know what it was they wanted to stop happening. So she's on her face. They've got a knee or boot in her back. They're pulling on her leg, so they're dragging her face through the gravel and bloody. And then Sharif, who is a very cool guy, is saying to the rioting police, calm down. And they take him, they throw him up against the wall, kick him twice in the chest, and take him down. So I get a call on the floor of the convention in the middle of the Alaska delegation. It's Mike Burke, our senior producer, who most recently was trying to ask Mr. Allison how, much, how many hundreds of millions of dollars he was pouring into the um, election year. But in 2008, he's calling and says, get to 7th and Jackson quickly. Sharif and Nicole have been bloodied and arrested. So what are you talking about? They're digitizing tape. And he said, no, get there fast. I had just gotten to the convention floor. I got all the fancy Secret Service credentials that allow me to get near presidents, vice presidents, kings and queens and ambassadors to interview them. And I raced off the floor with Rick Rowley, our videographer then, who is with Big Noise Films. We raced down the street saying, well, we get to the 7th and Jackson. It's a big parking lot. Riot police have surrounded the area. They've completely contained the area. I go up to the police, and I say, can I speak to your commanding officer? Um, two of my colleagues have been arrested. They have credentials like I do. I just came from the convention floor. We need to have them released. It wasn't seconds before they ripped me through the line, twisted my arms back, uh, slapped the handcuffs on, slammed me against a car and then against the wall and onto the ground. And they charged me with a misdemeanor interfering with a peace officer. A peace officer. If only there was a peace officer in the vicinity. So I still on the ground, I am looking for Sharif and Nicole. That's why I had come there. And I can't find Nicole, but I see Sharif across the parking lot, his arms behind his back. I begged to be brought to him. And the police officer, he made the handcuffs so tight, I couldn't feel my hands. And he didn't want nerve damage. I thought, should I tell the guy, all right, I'm going to ask the officer. As he's taking me across, I said, could you loosen my handcuffs a little bit? Actually, I'd like you to take them off. But if you could loosen my handcuffs a little bit, because I can't feel my hands anymore, he tightened them. So I'm brought over to Sharif and we're standing there and we're demanding to be released. The Sharif's arm is bleeding. We're demanding to be released. Whereupon the Secret Service come and rip the credentials from around our necks. And we kept saying, you can see we're journalists, we demand to be released, you can see our credentials, and they rip them off. So I'm brought into the police van, and that's where Nicole is. Face bleeding, arms behind her back, credential on. I said, Nicole, what happened? And this is all happening quickly. I can hardly talk to Sharif, I can hardly, but Nicole, we're in a van together as we're going to be locked up. So I said to her, what happened? And she said, well, I ran down and this is what happened. And she described I'm filming and they came at me and then, Nicole, and then Sharif, um, they attacked him. Uh, and so they bring me to the police garage where they erected cages to put the protesters in. And they bring Nicole and Sharif to jail. They face felony riot charges. Um, it was because of independent media. They posted the video of our arrest online so quickly, and the response was unbelievable. Thousands and thousands of tweets, faxes, emails, um, phone calls to the Twin City authorities. All levels of people were calling in, and we ultimately, after hours, were released. Um, first me, then Sharif and Nicole from jail. I'm brought over to the convention center, because now the networks want to interview me. What happened? This is the first night of the convention. And I'm in the NBC skybox, and uh, I, the interview is done, the camera's closed, and an NBC reporter comes over and he says, I don't get it, why wasn't I arrested? And I said, oh, were you outside covering the protests as well? And he said, no. So I said, oh, so the thing is, I don't get arrested in the skyboxes either. <laughs> just showing up, you have to get out there, right? You have to cover what's happening on the convention floor. There's some very interesting people there, and there are all sorts of debates and discussions. You've got to get into those corporate suites, and you've got to get out onto the streets, because that's where the uninvited guests, the thousands of people who also have something very important to say. And we shouldn't, you know, democracy is a messy thing, and it's our job to capture it all, and we shouldn't have to get a record when we put things on the record. 
So, the next day, the police chief holds his news conference to announce how successful the police operation is for the first day of the Republican convention, and this is what we can expect for the next four days. <laughs> so I raise my hand, I get into, oh, the process, the police officer who opened the door for the news conference was my processing officer the night before. So I said, okay, you not only have to let me into this news conference, you have to let me out when it's done. <laughs> so I go into the press conference, I raise my hand in the press conference, and I say to Chief Harry, and I want to know what you have instructed your police officers to do. I describe what happened to Sharif and Nicole and to me. And I said, and how do you expect us to operate in this atmosphere? And he said, we could embed with a mobile field force. The police mobile field force, embed. The next day I saw a Fox reporter with his Fox baseball cap in the middle of this moving police organism going down the streets of St. Paul. You know, you know what he means by embed? Like reporters embed in the front lines of troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, I'm not saying these reporters aren't brave, but I think the embedding process has brought the media to an all-time low. Um, you know, the, You are eating with the troops, sleeping with the troops. Your life is in their hands. How do you think you're going to cover the war? If you're going to embed with the troops, you have to embed in Iraqi communities and Afghan hospitals and the peace movement around the world to get the full implications of war. And it's not only a problem embedding with troops abroad, but embedding with the establishment in Washington as well. And the idea that this flawed model of reporting is now being brought back to the United States, and this is how we are required to cover American cities and to recover these celebrations of democracy. This is the only way that will ensure that we won't get bloodied and arrested by the police. Um, we sued the Twin Cities police uh, because we felt it was absolutely critical. I mean, that week, 40 reporters were arrested. When Sharif was arrested, uh, released that night, he was in a cell with the AP photographer who didn't get released when Sharif did. Um, uh, but because there was such an outcry, because the vi video of us getting arrested went viral, it was the most watched YouTube video of the first two days of the convention. This is the power of independent media. It is quite literally liberating. Um, so we sued, and um, this is a process of a number of years. And just this past uh, winter, we we finalized a settlement with the Twin Cities Police. We got a landmark settlement with the police and the Secret Service, a six-figure settlement, as well as an agreement, an agreement by the St. Paul Police that they would develop a protocol for dealing with journalists. And we made the announcement of the settlement at Zuccotti Park. It was in the midst of the occupation. As a warning to the police officers there and leading into the Tampa and Charlotte conventions, um, that to tell them that they would have to pay a price, quite literally, um, financially, and uh, for engaging in these unlawful arrests, not only of journalists, but engaging in unlawful arrests overall. You know, this is all geared to squelching dissent in this country. Uh, when you are afraid that you're going to be arrested, that people will be beaten up, it is less likely that you will go out. And yet, democracy, you know, dissent is what will save us. It's what this country was founded on. And it's our job as journalists, there's a reason why our profession is the only one explicitly protected by the U.S. Constitution, because we're supposed to be the check and balance on power. So I want to end on the issue, on the story of movements, uh, where I began, uh, just in Charlotte, being so inspired by the lunch counter sit-ins. Um, the story of Rosa Parks, which I know I told before, but it's a story that should be told over and over, and not the one. Most people know the story, but there's a part of the story that you don't know because the media doesn't repeat it. Rosa Parks sits down the bus December 1st, 1955. She gets arrested for not getting up for a white passenger, and she launches the civil rights movement of this country. In fact, she launches Martin Luther King because five days later when she's in court, Montgomery Improvement Association has its meeting December 5th, 1955, and they choose as the leader of the movement 
development that will boycott the buses that leads to the desegregation of the transportation system. Uh, Supreme Court decision a year later, they choose as a leader a young minister who's just come into town, Dr. Martin Luther King. She launches Dr. Martin Luther King, incredibly brave woman. And when she died, democracy now raced to Washington. Her body lay in state in the Capitol Rotunda, the first African-American woman to lay in state there, and then brought to a church in Washington before the big funeral in Detroit. And at the church, thousands of people came out. Oprah was inside. Cicely Tyson was inside. Big speakers outside. So people outside here, thousands were there. And it's, we were there outside, because it's more often interesting to be outside. And we interviewed a young woman. And I always like to say this in a college setting. She emailed her. She said, I said, what are you doing here? She said, well, I emailed my professors. I said, I won't be in class today. I'm going to get an education. <laughs> so, <laughs> Amazing, and the media covered this. I remember CNN's words as they covered um, Rosa Parks. They told the story. I mean, everyone knows Rosa Parks was a great American hero. But they said she was simply a tired seamstress. She was no troublemaker. That's where they got it wrong. Rosa Parks was a first-class troublemaker. She knew exactly what she was doing on that day. Right? She knew exactly what she was doing on December first, 1955, because she was the local secretary of the NAACP. She worked with. E.D. Nixon, who came out of radical labor politics, he was the president. He worked with A. Philip Randolph to organize the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, the black porters on the trains um, of the Pullman cars. They were all thousands of them called George, not because they were named George by their mothers, but they were called George for George Pullman, the owner of the trains, just a sense of why they had to organize. And then A. Philip Randolph went on to organize the 1963 March on Washington, the greatest organizer of all time. E.D. Nixon worked with him. He worked with Rosa Parks. They've been challenging the racist laws for years. She'd sat down on the bus and refused to get up a number of times before. Other young women had refused to get up. Again, you never know when that magic moment will come. But if you're involved in social change, and the media denigrates activists, but what could be more noble than dedicating your life to making the world a better place? That's the story of Rosa Parks. And to show how brave she was, just go back a few months, the atmosphere of the time, the summer of 1955, Emmett Till, the 14-year-old African-American boy from Chicago. His mother, Mamie, sends him for a couple of weeks to Money, Mississippi, to get out of the city for the summer, to be with his aunt and uncle and his cousins. And he's asleep at night. A white mob pulls him out of bed. And they say he wolf whistled at a white woman. And they beat him, and he ends up in the bottom of the Tallahatchie River. When his body was dredged up and sent back by train in a casket to, to Chicago, Mamie Till, his mother, was incredibly courageous. She said she wanted the casket open for the wake and the funeral. She wanted the world to see the ravages of racism, the brutality of bigotry. Thousands of people streamed by his casket and saw it. And then Jet Magazine and other black publications took photographs of his distended, mutilated head. And they were actually published. And they were seared into the history and consciousness of this country. Maybe tell it something very important to teach the press of today. Show the pictures. Show the images. Could you imagine for just one week if we saw the images of war in this country? Yeah. If on every... The, surviving newspaper photograph and story for just one week of a baby dead on the ground in Afghanistan or killed by a drone attack in Yemen. Uh, if on everyone's Facebook wall, if every tweet involved a story of a soldier dead or dying, uh, if every radio and TV newscast, the top story was about a woman whose legs were blown off by a cluster bomb. For just one week, Americans are a compassionate people. They would say, no, war is not the answer to conflict in the 21st century. Now, I wonder this, and Dennis and I wrote about it in the silence majority. In that week before Mubarak fell in Egypt, um, we were covering what was happening there, and Sharif was on the ground there. And we learned that a young blogger named Kareem Amr had disappeared. He had been in prison for years, but he was let out, and he was a top reader, like so many others. And then he disappeared. He was walking, leaving the square one night, and they just, no one saw him again. So it was day after day, and so Dennis and I was texting Sharif, and I was saying, you know, what happened with Kareem? And so Dennis went to Kareem's blog, and on the top of it, it said, dedicated to Hans and Sophie.
official. And um, Hans and Sophie Scholl were the brother and sister in World War II Germany, um, who together with their professor and other students and workers organized the White Rose Collective, which was a collective. They were German Christians. They weren't Jewish. But they thought, what could they do in the face of the Nazi atrocity? And so they decided to print a series of pamphlets um, to get word out since the Germans would never be able to say they didn't know. And they knew this was very dangerous. On the fourth pamphlet were written the, word, were written the words, we will not be silent. Uh, Hans and Sophie, this brother and sister in World War II, um, they would get these pamphlets delivered all through Germany, you know, dropped in the marketplace in the middle of the night or just thrown into a courtyard somewhere and, or into a schoolyard. Ultimately, they were captured by the Nazis. They were charged, they were tried, they were convicted, and they were beheaded. But that philosophy, that motto, should be the Hippocratic Oath of the media today, should be the Hippocratic Oath of us all today. We will not be silent. Democracy now. Please consider that. 